You probably think keeping a 430-ton airplane flying is just a physics problem. Think again. The real challenge starts when the plane's back on the ground. Consider for a moment the difficulties facing modern airports as they link and shrink our busy world. They are models of intricately coordinated organization. Symphonies of managed chaos and unexpected change as they send more people further, faster. Over 72,000 of us hurl ourselves into the air on thousands of planes every hour of every day and safely land anywhere from Anchorage to Zurich in less time than it takes to read the Sunday newspaper. 50 years ago, it took more than a day to fly from Los Angeles to Japan. Today, a flight from LAX to the new Kansai International Airport takes less than 14 hours. Kansai features the latest trend in airport construction. It is built on a 5.6 million square foot man-made island in the middle of the ocean. Kansai is a response to the overwhelming need for more airport services in a place where encroaching urban sprawl and a lack of available land make a big noisy downtown airport undesirable. It's a brilliant concept to look at. We think, well, wouldn't we rather land uh, closer to the action, closer to where we really want to be? The truth of the matter is we want to land where we can get in and out and get the minimum hassle in terms of being able to move through the facilities. And Kansai certainly offers that. Workers spent two years reclaiming land from the sea as a foundation for the airport filling a massive rectangular seawall with 6,357 million cubic feet of earth. They built a 2.3 mile long two-tiered access bridge for trains and cars. Plus, they included a hotel, shopping complex, observation deck, pedestrian walkways, administration buildings, street lamps, dozens of restrooms and everything else you'd find in a small city. First conceived back in 1968, the facility finally opened in 1994 as Japan's first 24-hour airport, operating a 2.1 mile long runway and an average of 319 flights per day. The usual array of security measures, gates and ticketing counters are housed in a terminal designed to reflect the culture and architecture of the region. The concept of building offshore airports uh, and airports in locations where you otherwise might not have expected them uh, are becoming more and more to vogue. There are risks, of course, to building an airport at sea. Engineers expected Kansai to settle a little. Unfortunately, it is settling faster than engineers expected at a rate of nearly four feet per year, and officials are scrambling for a solution. It hasn't been a smooth ride to Kansai from Kitty Hawk, but it has been an exciting evolution. Aviation and airports have grown together into multi-billion dollar industries that do far more than provide planes with places to land. But that's how they began at the turn of the last century. The initial airports were little more than uh, afterthoughts. They were grass fields that were out in the middle of uh, farmers' pasture, little reception areas for passengers. Farmers' pastures were good locations because they were flat, clear, and the farmer usually had reliable weather information for the pilots. Partly as a byproduct of the First World War, air travel caught on more quickly in Europe than in the United States. Roads and railways had been destroyed, and often the easiest path from one country to another was by air. The war also produced experienced pilots. European governments subsidized airports in London, Paris, and Berlin, where large facilities were modeled on the grand train stations of the 19th century. Passengers merely walked from a large foyer out to a single gate, or onto an open field. In America, a spectator sport full of daredevils would be transformed by the post office into a lucrative courier service for the mail. 
the airlines were getting a subsidy to carry mail in their very earliest stages. As a matter of fact, they really didn't want to carry passengers because they didn't have to feed the mail. They just put it on the plane. It was a simple process. It was also a deadly one as ill-equipped pilots flew unscheduled routes through unpredictable weather. 31 of the first 40 pilots hired by the Postal Service in 1919 died in crashes within six years. In response, the Postal Service opened their airmail operation to private contractors who bid on specific routes. But that would all change with Walter Folger Brown's appointment as Postmaster General in 1929. Brown encouraged commercial aviation by forcing ragtag independent airlines to merge into a handful of large ones. When he took over, there were about 42 little airlines in the United States. He, he said, we want a proper national system. In 1927, the aviation industry was bolstered by a public relations event almost as monumental as the discovery of flight itself. This is Lowell Thomas in New York. He made it. Charles A. Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy as they call him, landed at Le Bourget Airport, Paris, at 5.24 this afternoon. Lindbergh became the first person to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic, landing in Paris in his spirit of St. Louis on May 21st, thus opening the age of transatlantic international air travel. What Charles Lindbergh did for commercial aviation has been to, to a large extent overlooked. He'd take his spirit of St. Louis into a town. He'd land at the farmer's field at the edge of town, be escorted to the steps of City Hall. The mayor would come out and hand Charles Lindbergh a key to the city, and in most cases, a week, a month later, the city would float a bond for a half a million dollars and build an airport. But what exactly was an airport? Was it a kind of train station, an open field? As land became more scarce uh, and, and more costly, it became obvious that you couldn't have these very large land sections dedicated strictly for uh, an all-field uh, type of airport, and so therefore uh, the whole runway concept was developed. But where to put the runway? In 1929, the Lehigh Portland Cement Company sponsored a competition that produced some curious results. One submission had airplanes landing on runways suspended atop city skyscrapers. They love the idea of gridding out patterns. Um, and so there's aesthetically wonderful patterns, stars, spokes. The designs that appeared in this airport competition are done by architects, for the most part, who had no experience in airport design and also never seem to have been hired since. Landing airplanes on top of skyscrapers may have been far-fetched, but landing them on water soon became commonplace. During the early 1930s, the epitome of passenger plane travel was the luxurious flying boat, an innovative airplane that used its smooth, reinforced underbelly to take off and land. All one needed was a few hundred feet of calm seas and a dock. In fact, uh, uh, the very first passenger air airline actually started as a seaplane service in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, in the early days, the seaplanes were very popular. Miami's Dinner Key became America's very first international airport, offering trips to southern international destinations on Pan American Airlines. In fact, the original terminal at Dinner Key was a houseboat. One prominent visitor to Miami's Dinner Key was New York's Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, who wouldn't be satisfied until his city built the greatest airport in the world. International passenger service was burgeoning in Europe between the wars. In Hamburg, Germany, for instance, an innovative brick terminal was handling 62 passengers a day when it was completed in 1929. Efficiency and organization became a keystone as architects built new airports in places like Germany, France, and England. 
This attention to efficient traffic flow is apparent at London's Gatwick Airport, which opened for international passenger service in 1936. The lovely thing about Gatwick, and it should be pointed out that the original Gatwick terminal was a modern miracle, in that it didn't take a long distance to get from the front door to the airplane, that it had a circular design, much like a beehive at the end of a finger, and it had covered walkways out to the airplanes. It had many of the elements that you see today in a modern airport. The beehive terminal allowed a plane landing at Gatwick's open field runway to park at one of many gates, rather than one or two gates that handled Gatwick's roughly a dozen daily flights. It also included telescoping canopies that could protrude from the terminal out to a loading airplane, like a spoke on a wheel. This innovation kept passengers protected from the elements, evolving into the loading ramps used today. Access to the beehive was through an underground walkway. Critics complained that the circular gate left no room for expansion. But in fact, the design allowed for multiple beehives throughout the airport. In America, New Jersey's Newark Airport was the world's busiest in 1935, with 30 flights a day. Handling only domestic flights, Newark was not an international airport. But it inadvertently inspired one. Newark Airport was the, the aerial gateway for New York City. In fact, Mayor LaGuardia had a flight on American Airlines from Chicago in 1937, and he landed at Newark, and he told the pilot, no, my ticket says New York, and I want you to take me there. So the, they took off from Newark and flew. It was a press gag, of course, but they flew to Floyd Bennett Field. Floyd Bennett Field was New York's official airport, but it was further from Manhattan than Newark was, so the Postal Service used Newark for its airmail into New York. LaGuardia wouldn't stand for that. Make no mistake about it, this airport was not going to be denied. Mayor LaGuardia was going to build this airport and there was no question about it. LaGuardia hired the architects who designed Dinner Key in Florida. The Art Deco flavor of that earlier airport would be repeated in New York's new municipal airport, eight miles from the city. The circular marine air terminal was positioned on the shore to handle the luxurious seaplane flights. The planes would float over to the back of the terminal dock by piers that provided walkways inside the rotunda. The airport also provided international travel via seaplane, as land-based passenger planes could not yet carry passengers overseas. The seaplanes traveled east to Europe with fueling stops at coastal ports in Canada, Greenland and Iceland. New York City not only had a world-class airport, it had an international one. LaGuardia opened up the entire European landscape to scheduled air flights, as well as the domestic landscape to scheduled flights into New York. The airport also had a terminal for land-based domestic flights. Significantly, travelers at the airport were divided for greater efficiency. Departing passengers were upstairs, arrival passengers came downstairs. There was a clear definition between arrival and departing passengers. And of course on the departure level were all the great services, the beautiful restaurant, the, uh, the open terrace they called it. It was, a, it was a lovely affair. New York Municipal Airport boasted two nearly mile-long runways, handling 250 flights its first summer in 1939. On opening day, a group of skyriders flew above the crowds and memorably wrote, Name it LaGuardia. It took the city council a couple of years to rename the airport LaGuardia, but it became a hot spot soon after it opened. The observation decks were busy day and night watching the airplanes come and go. Barber shops were here in the 30s. There were small coffee shops and intimate cozy little areas at the airport to sit and have a quick drink before a flight. What the mayor and others who created LaGuardia Airport couldn't have anticipated was the rapid expansion of passenger airplane travel over the next decade. Air travel demand greatly increased, especially after World War II, and LaGuardia was clearly inadequate to handle the volume of flights, both domestic and international. New York needed another airport. 
World War II had stimulated the development of larger, faster, more efficient aircraft that could also travel further. Redesigned after the war, these new multi-engine planes not only carried more passengers on longer trips, they sounded the death knell of the elegant but inefficient flying boats which carried only about a dozen passengers. These new aircraft demanded more from the airports that serviced them. They sacrificed the ability to take off quickly in a short space, but by having longer runways and getting up a much higher speed to take off, they could carry heavier loads. And uh, the length of runways began to grow. And by the end of the Second World War, you had to have at least a mile of runway if you were going to hope to be recognized as a class airfield. Airports in Europe also expanded to accommodate the new planes. Amsterdam's 30-year-old Schiphol International Airport, for instance, was destroyed during the war but rebuilt and reopened in 1946, ready for the larger planes. In addition to refurbished airports, brand new airports, like England's Heathrow, 15 miles from London, met the international demand. Within its first year of operation, airport planners speculated building nine runways to handle all the traffic. They ultimately built three. While Heathrow was being built overseas, in America, New York International Airport opened in 1948, in Jamaica Bay at the southeast end of Long Island, 15 miles from the city. Later renamed John F. Kennedy International Airport, it was enormous. Well, you could take all of LaGuardia Airport and fit it very neatly inside the passenger terminal oval at Kennedy. There's 600 acres here, there's 5,000 acres there. So there was the feeling that there was an endless amount of room to grow. But runway length was not the only difference between LaGuardia and JFK. Instead of a single passenger terminal serving a host of airlines, JFK pioneered the airport city concept, with each airplane building its own terminal. It also had its own police department and its own electrical power plants. The most interesting thing about JFK International Airport was here was the ultimate expression of the airlines versus the railroads and the steamships. Every one of the carriers went out to that field and built their own statement. The buildings were designed with flair and a sense of destination and a sense of excitement. The 150-foot control tower completed in 1952 was one of the earliest freestanding control towers, coordinating roughly 50 flights a day. JFK was America's busiest international airport throughout the 1950s. But the introduction of passenger jet aircraft in 1958 meant bigger planes and more flights. Airports would have to adjust to the jet age. The technology of flight advanced yet again in the 1950s when passenger jets sent a shockwave through the community of airport architects. Bigger, faster, heavier planes required leaner, cleaner, more efficient jet age airports. Jet aircraft technology uh, allowed the aircraft to uh, become larger and larger because of the uh, thrust to weight ratios um, and as the aircraft got larger being able to get the aircraft into a gate uh, without uh, touching wings with an airplane that might be sitting uh, in the next gate over uh, became a real problem. So did the noise. Jets were louder than propellers. Airports needed more room to land the bigger planes, and they needed to be far enough from the city to avoid noise pollution. Yet they had to be close enough to be convenient. Larger, more efficient planes meant more cost-efficient flights. As a result, air travel opened up to even more consumers. The success of the jet is not so much the speed that it offered, but that it reduced costs so dramatically. And when the seat mile costs go down, then that enables a volume of traffic uh, and, and invites a new community. 
Commercial jet service began at London's Heathrow in 1952, six years before any other international airport, with flights to Johannesburg, South Africa. In 1953, passengers through Heathrow topped the million mark, the first airport to do so. Three years later, Heathrow saw three million. The first international airport in America built specifically for the jet age was Washington's Dulles, opened in 1962 and designed by Aero Saarinen. Three runways at Dulles were constructed of reinforced poured concrete, each over two miles long. A modern air traffic control tower was constructed to a height of 177 feet, 27 feet higher than JFK's tower. Dulles also pioneered the use of traveling lounges, or people movers, to ferry passengers more efficiently to their gates. Instead of trying to put a lot of people in a gate situation and jam them in, you could move people onto these people movers that would take them out to the aircraft waiting to, to, to board to take off. So it, it attempted several different technologies which have become, in one way or another, commonplace at airports all over the world. Situated more than 25 miles from Washington, D.C., on 10,000 acres, the airport was planned for rural Virginia to reduce noise pollution and provide the extra room required by jets. However, communities soon sprouted up near Dulles, as they often do around airports, to take advantage of opportunities the dramatic new airport would inevitably generate. Saarinen's startling design included a roof line that swept dramatically up in a metaphor of flight. You want to have sort of that uh, aerodynamic flow, if you will. Lots of light, uh, lots of uh, open space, uh, uh, sort of the embodiment again of uh, you know, blue skies and, and uh, the sky's the limit. The terminal at Dulles International Airport was undeniably, unequivocally, unabashedly an airport. As Dulles was making an architectural impression in the east, Another jet age airport in the West was doing its best to keep a low profile. Los Angeles International Airport, or LAX, began in the teens as an airfield in the bean fields 18 miles west of downtown LA, but quickly grew after the war. Expanding into an international airport in the late 1950s, it took a radically different approach to architecture than Dulles. I've often referred to this airport as a, an airport without any exterior architecture. When you drive in, the buildings on uh, either side are one and two stories, and uh, you see a road and you see glass fronts, and you don't see any structures. With the strong Los Angeles car culture, the architects anticipated lots of vehicles coming to the airport and designed accordingly. Traffic is mitigated by LAX's innovative horseshoe-designed roadway that passes separate terminals aligned in a row. The reason for this in Los Angeles is that we did not want to make the passenger walk further than 40 feet from where he unloaded his baggage at the curb to the face of the ticket counter. Within the Horseshoe Roadway were parking lots, which could and would be expanded into multi-level parking garages. The design was so effective at controlling traffic that it took some observers by surprise. When we opened in 1961, the LA Times especially came out and photographed the empty streets and uh, uh, talked about the fact that we'd overspent of the $20 million for the terminal. And in the ensuing 20 years, population and travel went up, airplanes got bigger, and more people were traveling. Then in 1982 it was, uh, we built the second level Los Angeles improved on the old LaGuardia concept of dividing, arriving, and departing travelers by separating them before they even got out of their cars. At LAX, departing travelers are sent to the upper level roadway and arrivals to the lower roadway. Observers were once again surprised at the success of the scheme. So when we opened the new second level roadway, uh, they were out again with the mobile units, but the story was that 
gee, we're sorry, folks, we're not going to be able to come out here anymore and report on the traffic jail because there aren't any. But uh, that was almost 20 years ago now, and we're back to the point where traffic is overloading the second level roadway. LAX was one of the first airports to have the fueling hydrants built into the aprons of the tarmac to facilitate underwing fueling, thus avoiding expensive collisions between jet wings and fueling carts. LAX incorporated a cutting-edge baggage claim system built around the new carousel design. Luggage could now be loaded onto a conveyor belt that whisked it to a retrieval area, often arriving there before its owner did. A state-of-the-art control tower, 13 stories high, set on top of the airport administration building, handling nearly 1,500 flights a day and carrying roughly 33,000 people on three runways, each roughly two miles long. The sheer size of the equipment was daunting. Originally, they had three levels of nothing but electronics. And through the years, and the electronics improvements came along, they just reduced the size of the equipment down to where they didn't need all that space. After constructing a clean, efficient, subtle airport, the architects at LAX then planted an outlandish landmark smack in its center, whose main purpose was to symbolize the futuristic jet age theme of the airport. The overtly architectural restaurant and observation deck, with its spindly legs reminiscent of an alien spacecraft, was named the Theme Building. When LAX opened, projections indicated that it would never need more than 10,000 parking spaces. They were off by at least a multiple of three. Anticipating future needs is one of the most important and most difficult tasks for airport officials. Looking at how the market may respond, not just five years from now, but 20 years from now, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of money and a lot of planning and environmental work to build a new hangar. In fact, uh, these days, just to add capacity to an airport, it takes almost 10 years just to build a new runway. The volume of air traffic is increasing at such a rate that planners can barely keep up. Over 635 million people traveled by plane in 1999 up 22 million over the previous year. The importance of airport support facilities is greater than ever. Older airports must adapt or fail. At 53 square miles, Denver International Airport, or DIA, is one of the largest airports in the world. Completed in 1995, DIA is six times the size of LaGuardia and JFK airports combined. It is more than twice the size of Manhattan Island. In fact, the entire city of Boston could fit within the confines of DIA. Approximately 23 miles from downtown Denver, it handles over 104,000 passengers each day with over 1,371 flights taking off and landing on its five, nearly two and a half mile long runways. One of the lines I heard that uh, really defines that well is, how much metal can you pack in the sky? Constructing the massive airport took a roughly 10,000 person crew over five years. Situated on the plains of Colorado's eastern prairie, the task of leveling the land was an enormous job that encompassed shifting over 110 million cubic yards of earth. Runways were built in layers, and over 2.5 million cubic yards of concrete were used to complete runways, taxiways, and aprons. Denver's flight control tower at 327 feet, the tallest in North America, was designed with the latest Doppler radar innovations to evaluate weather conditions in an environment that sees violent tornado spawning thunderstorms and icy wind shearing blizzards. DIA, like LaGuardia, divides loading and unloading passengers onto different floors to reduce congestion. Evoking the traveling lounges at Dulles, a light rail system at DIA takes passengers from their gates to the central terminal for picking up luggage and accessing ground transportation or parking lots. 
The central terminal is packed with so many retail outlets that DIA resembles a giant shopping mall. It's a sort of a mini city in itself. There are 25,000 plus employees at the Denver airport, for instance. And so there's a need for everything you can think of from uh, nurse stations, a doctor, a chapel, uh, meeting spaces. DIA's architects not only made the airport gigantic, they went one step further and made it an icon, one of the most instantly recognizable airports ever built. We were very careful to try to incorporate something of this region. And so I searched long and hard for uh, inspiration for something that said Colorado, said the West. And the thing that, uh, for me, that kept being there was the mountains. The mountains are very unique in this area of the country. And so the sort of ridge shapes or peaks and valleys that we created with the roof there was inspired by the mountains. And I think it, it kind of folds into the aspect of making buildings unique and different for the place. With an outer shell made of waterproof Teflon coated woven fiberglass, the roof membranes comprise over 15 acres of white peaks, which reflect 90% of the daylight. The remaining 10% of daylight sufficiently lights the interior of the terminal during the day. Amazingly, the roof membranes weigh less than two pounds per square foot and neither conduct nor store heat. The airport cuts quite a profile alone out on the plains. Incredibly, despite its size and newness, DIA is already becoming inadequate. Some people complain that there isn't enough parking and efforts have been made to increase the facilities. Others complain that it's too far from the city and efforts are being made to design better access. Still others say it won't be able to handle increased traffic, up more than 20% since it opened its doors in 1995. Finally, some complain that there is always construction taking place. And not just at Denver, but practically everywhere. Airports never seem quite finished. One of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're designing an airport is that the life of the building is going to be over a long period of time, maybe 50 years, maybe longer. But over that 50-year period of time, we're going to see a lot of changes. And so to be able to create a building that has lots of flexibility in the future is paramount in the design of an airport. In Europe, expansion at 50-year-old Orly International Airport in Paris did not prevent the need for a brand new airport, which opened in 1974 as Charles de Gaulle International Airport. Anticipating jumbo jets in its design, de Gaulle nevertheless expanded in 1983, 1989, and again in 1994. Closed to commercial flights during World War II, London's Gatwick reopened in the 1950s to steady growth and expansion despite continuing as a single runway airport. Today, Gatwick sees roughly 30 million passengers a year through its terminals. Amsterdam Schiphol, which saw renovations in the 1960s, 1980s, and 1990s, also averages 30 million passengers a year. In America, JFK's airport redevelopment, the largest ever, will cost over $9 billion and includes a light rail system linked to the city's subway and railroad. New and renovated terminals will spruce up the aging facility. Dulles enlarged its main terminal, opened new concourses, and added gates to handle traffic, which rose 26% between 1998 and 1999 alone. Dulles is the fastest growing of the world's 50 largest airports. LAX plans to improve with freeway and railway extensions, a people mover, a new terminal, and more parking. LAX, like all airports, is imperfect. If you hang the name of the city on the airport, and the airport's a stinker, the city will take the rap. It can be out in the country. Sooner or later, the city will show up around the airport, and you'll have to deal with it. But from the get-go, the airport has to work. It has to be up and ready to roll. With all this activity going on, coordinating flights, travelers and cargo, managing noise, expansion and adaptability, you'd be surprised just how much your international airport is doing that you don't even know about.
Welcome to McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, Nevada. Don't forget to drop a quarter in the slot machine on your way to your luggage. When visiting London's Gatwick, be sure to grab some English tea biscuits as you leave the gate. Every airport reflects the character of its place. But beneath the surface, international airports function in roughly the same way, using roughly the same language. They have to. There's a kind of choreography, a ballet, that has to take place. And the speed at which that takes place determines the number of passengers that you're able to service. It's such an immensely complicated task to make this system work. But it's not simply making one system work. It's making hundreds of systems work all over the country. The system at LAX has to work in similar ways to the system at LaGuardia or National or Dulles. Those interconnected systems help guarantee that your travel will be safe and pleasant. It begins with security. Lots of security. Control rooms full of agents monitor television feeds from cameras all over the airport. From curbside check-in to terminal gate. At entry to gate area security, multiple cameras capture different angles as passengers unload their belongings for the search and scan. This security gauntlet began in the early 70s after a series of hijacking incidents prompted the Federal Aviation Administration to require that all airports search travelers and their bags. Here at LAX, after a woman places her bags on the belt, a thief delays her from walking through the metal detector. On the other side, a different angle reveals his partner taking the woman's purse. This maneuver is known as a diversionary theft. Police were later able to retrieve the woman's purse by examining the security tape and identifying the suspects. High above the shops and restaurants, traffic control is managed within view of the runways. Controllers handle each of the planes that land every few seconds, every hour of every day of every year. Slips of paper represent every flight. Computers facilitate the communication between plane and tower, where the central controller gives the pilot his flight pattern. Another controller leads the plane out of the gate and onto the taxiway, and a third guides the plane into the air. They are absolutely the most valuable element at the, the, the airport. We operate 2,000 operations here. That's 1,000 airplanes landing, 1,000 airplanes taking off on a daily basis. The timing, the preciseness, the scheduling of all that, and their ability to manage that is really quite amazing. Down on the tarmac, rescue operators rehearse for disaster. Airports have to expect the unexpected. Their efforts make airline travel one of the safest modes of transportation. Millions of people travel through customs every year at any given international airport. While customs officials use X-ray equipment to look for illegal imports such as plants and animals, they also use dogs like this beagle to sniff out contraband. The dog taps suspect baggage with its paws to signal something suspicious. In this case, an orange from Turkey. This checkpoint makes agricultural inspectors happy, knowing that fruit or meat-borne toxins will find it difficult to get through the gauntlet. It makes the beagle happy, too. He gets a treat every time he finds something. Dozens of airlines plan and adjust their schedules while an army of mechanics check planes and conduct periodic tune-ups. Retail outlets bring in as much as $400 million in combined revenue at some airports. So much revenue that new airports today, like movie theaters, reap much of their profits from concessions. Some airports are uh, focusing more on becoming a shopping mall than they are uh, moving passengers in and out. Uh, and that's become a very important revenue source also for airports. Increasingly, airlines and airports are catering to non-human travelers. The biggest development at the airport is the air cargo business. We don't hear a lot about air cargo, but air cargo is the growing star in the, uh, in the transportation firmament. Perfectly successful airlines survive without ever boarding a paying customer. Instead, their planes are loaded with high-priority letters and packages 
or maybe blue crab from Chesapeake Bay, or the latest fashions from the runways of Paris and Milan. Even the bodies of the recently deceased travel in the bellies of airplanes. Computerized tracking allows cargo to clear through customs often before the plane touches down in a new country. The newest airports have to work within this overarching system, even as they look for ways to improve on the past. This puts quite a burden on the architects who design airports such as the new Incheon Airport in Seoul, South Korea. Right now, Korean Airlines is the second largest air cargo carrier in the world. And the development of Incheon will further move that number along because the China market is everybody's goal. And Incheon will become an important trans gateway to the uh, entire uh, Asia Pacific market. The airport is built on a man made land bridge between two islands in the Yellow Sea, about 30 miles from downtown Seoul. The islands create a natural barrier to rough seas which might otherwise make the location a forbidding site. The remote location also mitigates the effects of noise pollution. Pinterest Bradburn Architects, who built Denver's airport, won a design competition to build the 5.6 million square foot central passenger terminal. They began with a model. In the design of buildings, we use models extensively for creation of the vision to help us uh, illustrate and communicate to our clients and to the public at large what it is we're trying to do. And they're particularly interesting and helpful whenever we have something that is unique in terms of its spatial quality or the form of the building. The $6.9 billion airport includes 2.3 mile long runways, two passenger terminals, and four remote concourses that will handle 27 million passengers a year. Incheon's control tower is 329 and a third feet high, three and a half feet taller than Denver's. The new airport is within three and a half hours flying time of 40 major metropolitan areas in the dynamic Pacific Rim. Undoubtedly, the airport's designers have left room for changes and adjustments for nobody really knows exactly where advancements in technology and engineering are going to lead. Amazingly, the next leap may be straight out of the atmosphere and into space. The Federal Aviation Administration already has as part of its uh, mission uh, the space program on the commercial side and so uh, um, you know, we're looking at spaceports, incorporating that with runways and launch facilities. Someday uh, we might be traveling to Mars and uh, airports will then become spaceports. International airports may someday become interplanetary ones. It's hard to imagine, but who could have predicted an airport like Incheon way back in 1939, when Mayor LaGuardia opened his airport in Queens? I think it's important for airport operators to maintain their sense of balance in terms of where they came from. I think that the old facilities, the classic terminals, are constant reminders of where we came from. As international airports build and rebuild themselves, their architects must constantly reflect and reinterpret those innovations which have made airports of the past successful, adaptable, and efficient. No longer modified train stations, international airports have evolved their own style, their own majesty. They are the first exotic destination on our far-flung journeys.